Are you smarter than one of my AP US history juniors on the first day back from winter break? <laughs> Let's see. On the first day back, I never wanna dive right into history again. We need to like get our brains warmed up. We need to just kind of review what we talked about in the fall. And I do a lot of previewing of what we're going to talk about in the spring. And so the way that I do this after we kind of review what we discussed in the fall and they're like, oh right, George Washington was a guy, is I put these years up on the board. So this morning for my AP kids, I put these years on the board and I said, discuss with the people at your table what's important about these years. I wanted to get their brains thinking about what are we going to be learning. And I also wanted to just gauge how much do they already know, what types, like what eras are they more interested in, that sort of thing. So pause, look over these years and see like how many of them could you explain to me like why it's an important year in American history. 1865 is the end of the Civil War. This is sort of like the year zero in American history, right? A lot of colleges even break out their U.S. history courses into like U.S. history up to 1865, U.S. history post-1865. If you're wondering, I'm infinitely more interested in the post-1865 because what I love to do is connect history to current events. And it's just a lot easier. You can draw basically a straight line from almost anything that occurred from kind of the Gilded Age on to something that's happening in our country right now. 1877 is the formal end of Reconstruction. Um, so this also means it's the rise of the formalized system of Jim Crow. 1898 is the Spanish-American War. This is a massive turning point for American foreign policy because officially after the Spanish-American War, we are an empire, big E, trademark, meaning we've taken colonies, the Philippines, Guam, Puerto Rico as a territory. Now, we have a great discussion in my class about like, were we really not an empire before 1898? Because if you ask an indigenous person or a Mexican person, uh, we were an empire before 1898. 1917 is the year the United States entered World War I, right? Three years into the war. Um, it wasn't because of the sinking of the Lusitania, by the way. The Lusitania was sunk in 1914, three years earlier. So, sorry. 1929, the stock market crash. It's not the singular cause of the Great Depression, but it is like a flashpoint that leads to the spiraling of our economy that leads to the Great Depression. 1945 is the end of World War II. Again, in the way that 1865 is a, a really key watershed year for American historians, 1945 is really important for um, international relations majors like me, for world historians, that sort of thing. Again, you'll see classes in college that'll be like international politics post-1945 because the world and kind of the world order and the way that we organize ourselves and the way that we think about human beings changes dramatically post-1945. 1968 is just like the most chaotic year in American history. I normally take a few days just to talk about this one year. Essentially, this is the high point or low point of a lot of these massive movements of the 1960s. So for example, Vietnam in 1968, at the very beginning you have the Tet Offensive, which is the first moment that a lot of Americans start to look and go, I think we might not win this war. Ooh, I don't know. 1968 is also considered kind of the end of this like golden age of the civil rights movement because Dr. King is assassinated in 1968. This is also a crisis point for the Democratic Party, which had really been dominant in national politics since FDR and all those New Deal Democrats. By 1968, LBJ is kind of on his way out. Vietnam is like hampering any of his other efforts. Uh, Bobby Kennedy is assassinated. So in 1968, Nixon gets elected. 1989, yeah, Taylor Swift was born, but also the fall of the Berlin Wall. It's the symbolic end of the Cold War and this beginning of kind of what's seen as a Pax Americana, like this moment where we are the only superpower really left standing throughout the 1990s. Like we have a little bit of an existential crisis. Like who are we if we don't have a common enemy? Enter 2001, the September 11th attacks, where we start this new war on terror. Now, I want to talk about 2016 and why I put it as kind of the end of our course. It's not because Trump was elected, right? That's the big thing that happens in 2016, and it is a really important year in American history. But for me, our class officially ends kind of with the Obama era, mostly just because anything from the last 10 years is still not history to me. It's still current events. We're still interpreting, trying to figure out what the hell it all means. And so even if you picked up a brand new U.S. history textbook, it would probably get you through Obama, maybe through the election in 2016 and then we'll probably pause and say we need more time to think about it. So we're still going to talk about the post-2016 United States, but we're going to talk about it as like a current events unit. We're asking questions. We're not claiming to like know the answers. I'm not going to give a big PowerPoint explaining the last eight years because like, God help me.